I'll introduce Dr. Kate Robinson, Dr. Hortensia Kuhn, Susan Elliott from British Business Bank, and Trudy Price from the Kent and Victor Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to, uh, to welcome you here today, uh, I'm Catherine Robinson, I'm Deputy Dean of the Kent Business School and I'm Academic Lead for our Medway campus at the historic Dockyard in Chatham. So um, I'm kicking off this morning uh, and I'm going to focus on those halcyon days when all we had to worry about was Brexit. Um, I'm going to start by highlighting um, the, the kind of the national level. And I think it's important that we reflect on where we're going as a nation um, in terms of what we're looking to achieve. Um, the conditions, including Brexit, uh, have not gone away since the, uh, the pandemic arrived and we will have to come back to those at some point. Uh, and as we see ourselves ease out of lockdown, uh, those conditions are still very much part and parcel of what we're doing. So I'm gonna begin by setting the scene um, of what existed prior to COVID-19, because as I say, these con conditions are still very much a, a very real long run concern. Hortensa will then uh, come in and focus on SME finance specifically before we then invite the contributions from our guests this morning. Tudor Price, uh, Deputy CEO of the Kent Chamber of Commerce and Susan Elliott, our regional representative from the British Business Bank. Um, they are then going to provide you with a whistle-stop tour of the uh, potential sources of finance that are, are, might be suitable for your needs before we then give you the opportunity uh, to contribute in breakout groups and have a chat about your own experiences. Um, so you will uh, have an opportunity to uh, have a chat. Very much appreciate it if you could put any questions in the chat and we will revisit these at the end of the session. I've posted the questions in the chat as well so to give you some time to reflect on these, but basically they will be, how has your business been affected by COVID during lockdown? Do you envisage things bouncing back uh, as we ease out? What's your biggest financial concern for the next 12 months? And what finance options uh, would you consider applying for over the next um, 12 months? Um, we'll then reconvene in uh, our main Zoom room to share our key thoughts and uh, questions and summarize points from the presentation. So that will be the opportunity to address any of the questions that have come up. Okay, so. If we begin with uh, the domestic picture, uh, we see that the UK has recently revamped its industrial strategy and put greater emphasis on industrial strategy, putting innovation very much at the heart of its productivity ambitions. Um, the industrial strategy talks about these grand challenges that uh, are likely to cross boundaries in terms of firms and, uh, and industries, artificial intelligence and data very much part of the fourth industrial revolution, the aging society and what that means for our workforce, clean growth and the importance of sustainable development, uh, and uh, the future of mobility in terms of logistics and, and transport. Um, so these are very much the sort of the high level overarching uh, objectives of the industrial strategy. But productivity is seen as very much uh, an essential element of uh, the continued prosperity and growth for the UK economy. And by productivity, we mean the efficiency with which we combine our inputs to produce outputs, usually measured in terms of labor productivity or output or value added per head or per hour. Um, but we also mean sometimes the uh, total factor productivity, which is a more holistic measure comparable across sectors with different capital and labour input mixes. So productivity is very much um, what we're looking for uh, from, from, from businesses. If we take an international view, we can look at the international uh, comparisons that are driving much of the policy around uh, the industrial strategy. And we can see that the UK has um, a considerable productivity gap to Germany, France, US, Italy, and also the productivity puzzle. 
um, we can see that um, this has been the cause of uh, much debate and there have been many explanations put forward for, for why we have this productivity puzzle. But basically, uh, we, uh, employment's remained high, but output has not uh, kept pace. Um, McKinsey has suggested that it's a combination of the size of the finance sector and that the uh, financial crisis uh, uh, had a, a, a real and lasting impact on the UK economy. Um, it's also in terms of uh, the high price of capital has favoured more labour intensive production um, uh, and so the growth in employment over output and also low levels of investment, hence the emphasis on R&D going forward. Patchy digitization and gaps in internet provision, I think we've all had some experience of over the last few months with our internet connections. But there are many explanations for the productivity gap, so I, I, I don't propose to go into too much detail here, but this is the, this is the fundamental driver of, of why the industrial policy is focusing here and now. About a year ago, the Business Productivity Review uh, developed a series of action points uh, uh, as a result of its study of UK firms. And really these action points focus on, um, focus on evidence base. They, um, they are very much based around uh, offering support to businesses, improving practices, improving insights and communication with small businesses, benchmarking tools, access to business uh, mentoring. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, I think what's very encouraging here is we can see the UK government putting a great deal of emphasis on the importance of SMEs and how, how integral they are to the overall productivity uh, development of the UK. Specifically, I just wanted to talk about a couple of these points, strengthening the local peer-to-peer -peer network um, to strengthen expertise in leadership, business development and technology adoption, which is obviously part and parcel of what we're trying to do here. And also um, highlight the knowledge transfer partnerships. And uh, I believe Marcus will be coming on to discuss a bit more about this towards the end of our session today. So I think, this is the regional picture, and I think there has been a recognised need to level up. This is still looking at productivity, so uh, at, at GVA per head, as a percentage of London. And we can see that since 1998, all regions have lost ground to London. Uh, in terms of the southeast, the dit dot line at the top, we can see that the southeast has proportionately lost 10 percentage points relative to its position uh, compared to London. And, and so we see the gap widening and this has been a big policy driver as well. So there's been, since certainly since the general election, there's been this recognised need to try and level up across regions within the UK. But there is a danger now, particularly with COVID, that we will be thinking about this in terms of levelling down, uh, which is of some concern. So what does the research say? Well, uh, in terms of SME survival, growth and productivity, there are some familiar stories that come through. When we read a lot of the policy related literature, they talk about young dynamic SMEs. We need to recognise that not all small firms are yet necessarily young. The average age of a UK micro enterprise is found to be around 22 years, for example. Growth is not a continuous process. Um, some work I did for Nesta with Jeff Mason a few years back uh, was very much finding that it's quite a lumpy process. High growth firms make up around 6% of the economy at any one time, but growth is quite sp sporadic. It's quite step changey. Um, so a high growth firm is not a high growth firm continuously or very rarely. R&D and innovation led uh, lead to improvements in productivity. And so this is why the UK government has emphasized this uh, huge uh, commitment to R&D as a percentage of GDP, 2.4%, uh, which is massive uh, compared to uh, traditional levels of R&D investment in the UK uh, uh, historically. Uh, and so, so we can see what that's saying. And then there's some recent evidence from the Small Business Survey 
in terms of what the current landscape looked like prior to COVID, 80% of SMEs were profitable and had uh, very, very much stable evidence of sentiment in terms of employment and turnover growth. So there was, prior to COVID, there was quite an optimistic uh, view of the future, despite Brexit, in spite of Brexit, in spite of the challenges that were facing us uh, prior to uh, COVID. In terms of the Longitudinal Small Business Survey for 2019, we can see that barriers to growth were identified as competition in the marketplace, red tape and taxation. Brexit was there, but it was much lower in terms of order of magnitude uh, compared to the competition that, they were, uh, that uh, small businesses were facing. Um, access to finance from the small business survey, we can see that much of these, many of these indicators have been quite stable over time. So 63% of SMEs are using some sort of external finance, chiefly credit cards and bank overdrafts, but more on that with Ortensa. I was quite impressed with the growth of peer-to-peer -peer lending, although it still remains very, very small. But of course, this is much more uh, determined by personal characteristics. And there's been some recent research that, that uh, brings together and synthesizes all the research uh, across different countries, particularly the US, on the personal characteristics that determine whether um, uh, companies, SMEs, are successful. Um, so the characteristics of the, the, the owner in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, attractiveness, trustworthiness in terms of appearance, linguistic skills, education, social networks. So they draw all this together and they present the evidence on, on what looks, what, what gives you the best chance of firstly attracting funding and secondly being successful in terms of being able to pay it back. So there's a multitude of interesting evidence emerging right now. Um, and I would say, from what I've read, the, the most significant uh, hit appears to be the startup finance. So rather than the SMEs uh, suffering as a sector, although it, it is tremendous, the biggest hit has been the fact that firms entering the, the industry uh, are, are, are really struggling. So I'm going to leave it there and hand over to Hortensa um, to pick up. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I think you have touched on most of the things, haven't you? Most of the issues that the SMEs are facing. So um, and let me see if I can go quickly back. I'll pick up, uh, my name is Hortensa Kuhn and I'm a lecturer in finance. Um, my main research interests lie in the area of capital funding. And I've done some research regarding uh, the impact that different businesses had, especially in Germany, UK and France after the financial crisis. So it comes natural to me to start with the SME financing choices, especially after the crisis when they had it really tough. Um, and they experienced very high loan rate, um, very high, oh, for some reason I can't see even my screen now, I need to minimize, yeah. Higher loan rejection rates, higher level of overdrafts and loan margins and more finance renewal than, finance, than uh, new finance applications. And the academic studies, especially in the area of corporate finance and entrep entrepreneurship financing, have found out that there are a few factors that have a huge impact on the success of SME raising funds. And these are size. I mean, if we are thinking about SMEs, we have to distinguish among three, uh, among three main categories, which are basically the medium companies, the small companies, as well as the micro companies. And this is where we see most of the problems, the micro companies where most of the enterprises, where most of these enterprises are basically owner slash manager run one single owner manager run so these will be the, or these were especially after the crisis the ones that were facing most of the challenges in terms of financing but another issue that SMEs face when it comes to raising finance is not having enough collateral uh, more recently in uh, the literature review uh, of different academic studies, we have found that the manager's characteristics and behavior seems to be some of the factors that are driving the decisions regarding different uh, financing options um, that uh, SMEs have. And uh, this was also picked up by Kate, I think, in the previous presentation that she gave us. So as a result of all these challenges that were faced by SMEs, especially after the 2007-2008 uh, crisis, UK government undertook a 
various policies. And one to be mentioned is that by the Enterprise Finance Guarantee Scheme, which was an extension of what we had for small uh, businesses uh, finance loans, but also the establishment and development of British Business Bank, as Susan probably will explain later on into more detail. Uh, very quickly, I've put together just an historical perspective in terms of um, the SME financing over the years based on the findings reported by British, uh, British Business Bank, so, um, a small businesses finance survey. And what you can pick up among those findings over the years is that most of these SME um, the owners and the managers of the SMEs, they do struggle to find the right advice in terms of raising the right uh, the amount of funding and in the right options that they want. And what these uh, surveys have also suggested is basically that most of the MSEs tend to rely heavily on short-term financing and more in terms of borrowing rather than equity. Only in, in the survey of 2017-2018, we can see that we have a larger portion of SMEs who are using advice when seeking finance. But still, there is a fear of rejection, um, although that has declined by 2018. And uh, on balance, more SMEs on that particular survey are starting to think about their financing options and how that will be affected as a result of Brexit. And this is where the uncertainty kicks in and it continues even in the findings reported in 2018-2019 uh, survey, where still one third of SMEs uh, thought obtaining equity or debt finance would be more difficult after Brexit. So, the moment that the uncertainty kicks in, either it may be a political or an economical uncertainty, a cost uncertainty, that uh, this is where we can see the SME is trying to uh, um, to find it more challenging in terms of raising more funding. And this is where they try to rely more on the use of very short term um, um, funding options, such as, for example, credit card financing or leasing and hire purchase, and heavily relying in personal savings. This continues, this trend seemed to continue also in 2019-2020, where personal savings continue to be the main source of financing. And most of the MSEs tend to rely once again on some form of external financing, such as credit cards, overdraft, leasing and hire purchase. Um, once again, we can't see most of the SMEs borrowing for long-term investment. It's mainly for working capital and for covering those short-term funding gaps. But what strikes me, especially looking at those findings over the years, is that the relationship that they have with the lender is the main factor that drives their decision in terms of borrowing. And we can see most of the MSEs tend to go to the same lender only because they, they know them better and they have established a long-term relationship. And this is, is also um, reported even in the findings of 2019, 2020, when we can see that most of the borrowing is coming from the five biggest banks. Um, regrettably, only a small number of SMEs are aware of the role of the British Business Bank. So we are very fortunate today to have Susan, who is going to talk more about the role of the British Business Bank in uh, helping or supporting the SMEs in raising finance and accessing the right sources of financing. I'm bringing it a little bit closer in terms of the time period and looking more in terms of the COVID, um, the impact that COVID has had or is going to have in the economy. The first point that we need to make clear is that um, although we have seen a crisis in 2007, 2008, that was mainly affecting the financial markets. So basically we had a dry source of um, funds coming from the financial institution. But when we are considering the um, uh, economic crisis mainly caused from the COVID-19, this we can refer to as a liquidity management crisis or as some some studies already in um, America as well as in Europe are referring to as a high street or main street crisis. The reason being is because it's affecting mainly all the most of the businesses, but heavily is affecting the SMEs. Uh, if we are thinking about the stages of this crisis, we can start talking about the lockdown period where basically we have a loss of income and sales. And most of the businesses, especially the SMEs, starting facing very high cash flow problems. So 
the, in terms of funding, we are still looking in those sources we will help them to cover the working capital needs rather than investing for long term. Once the economy is starting to open up, then we can start thinking more in terms of repairing or renewing the small businesses. And this is where we have to start thinking or basically the academics, the, uh, the professionals, as well as the government needs to start thinking about what type of credit uh, lines we have to provide for the SMEs. But it's not only that, it's also we will end up in a situation where most of the SMEs as well as other large businesses are going to face very high levels of debt. So the restructuring of debt will take more importance. And that, uh, because most of the companies will borrow, this will lead to a high problem that we have to face, such as the credit risk. So we have to think about the credit risk that uh, all businesses, including the SMEs, are going to face. So if we bring that closer to the impact that the SMEs are having, then the, the hardest hit group will be mainly the micro enterprises. Um, I have brought here, well, I have managed to pull out some um, of the figures from the Bank of England lending survey and the latest one for the second quarter of 2020 was um, uh, was made public only um, two days um, about sorry four days ago and you can see here that uh, basically we see the changes in terms of the lending that was available to SMEs in every quarter and the forecast for the next three months and what we can see especially if we're focusing on the second quarter of 2020 when we can see the impact of COVID we see that the uh, credit was available right to small businesses uh, the proportion of uh, loan applications from small, small businesses especially in the last quarter or in the second quarter of 2020 has risen right but the forecast is that in the next three months we wouldn't see such a high change in terms of the number of or the proportion of loan applications what strikes us and what we expect in a way is that the default rate on loans especially for small businesses is going to be quite a high is and that is the forecast i mean that was the forecast in the first quarter of 2020 but also that is the forecast for the next three months and that is also um, um is going to lead to a very high loss in terms of the default on loans to small businesses so that is something that we can take from basically these graphs um, that small businesses are going to have a very tough time ahead uh, we have already seen, we just saw the supply to, uh, of funding to the SMEs, but what about uh, their demand? I mean, we can see that the demand for the SMEs has gone up in the past three months, right? Um, and uh, the financial institutions or the lenders are not seeing that demand going up. Um, it's going down, actually, in the next three months. But what we see, surprisingly, is a fall in the demand for the credit card lending in the second quarter, right during the credit uh, during the COVID period, um, but um, a, a higher demand, a high positive change in terms of the demand for the other unsecured lending from small business chain. So they are looking more into uh, forms of short term credit, trying to cover all those cash flows or all those working capital needs that they have. Um, the, um, just looking at one of the recent uh, economic surveys that was taken by uh, the Kent Invicta Chamber of Commerce, um, we find out that more respondents have reported worsening rather than improving cash flow. And once again, we're reiterating that fact that we are looking also at the Bank of England lending survey that in the second quarter, uh, this worsening proportion doubled despite government mitigation aid for COVID-19, which some of the respondents were unable to access. So still we see problems of getting that help into the SMEs, and especially when we are referring to the Kent SMEs. And I wanted to bring it more closer to home, and I wanted to see, to look at the credit risk that the SMEs are facing. Just, uh, I plucked up some figures only yesterday, trying to see in terms of the number of liquidations that we had from just the, the last last few months from March to June 2020. And what you can see is that the number is quite high, especially for other services category or sector, which is um, the sector that includes mainly micro enterprises undertaking different type of services. Um, um, we also see that the hardest hit sectors, as we expected from the news and from different reports and surveys, are the construction, the wholesale, 
and retail traders, education and health, and also trans uh, hotel uh, tourism and transport. So this is where we have seen, unfortunately, the, the expectation is that the number of those liquidations and dissolutions for the following quarter are going to be much higher. Um, so that's why, I mean, I know I don't want to portray this pessimistic picture, uh, but this is why most of you are attending this workshop. So that's why we have an opportunity here to turn things around and to introduce you to different funding opportunities that have been available to um, SMEs. And I mean, probably you are aware of some of them, but the ones that we can mention here are the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, bounce back loans, loan schemes for high growth firms or future funds that are mainly uh, designated for uh, the startup and scale up companies. And that's why I'll leave the floor now. We are very fortunate today to have in this workshop two very knowledgeable people, which are Tudor and Susan, who are going to take you into more detail in um, the challenges and also opportunities that the Kent SMEs businesses are facing and the opportunities for raising more finance. So I'll leave the floor to Tudor. Uh, let me see if I can stop sharing on that. Well, Jennifer, thank you very much indeed for that uh, detailed insight. Um, I think it, it echoes a lot of what we're, we're hearing on the ground already. So. Okay, um, good morning. My name is Tudor Price, Deputy CEO of the Kent and Victor Chamber of Commerce. Um, I thought I'd uh, do this in sort of two parts this morning. Um, part one would just be to uh, just give you a bit of an over overview and some insight into the intelligence that we're gathering from the ground and Hortense already highlighted uh, one of the surveys that we did recently. And then just to give you some insights into the, uh, the advice that we give and guidance to businesses when they're looking to access uh, some of the government funding schemes that are out there. And then I'll just sort of run through on one or two of the key ones that we're working on at the moment. So just to put things in context, um, we have uh, obviously the Invicta Chamber of Commerce, uh, we're the accredited chamber for the county, uh, part of the British Chambers of Commerce network. Uh, we have four main areas of interest as a chamber. One is obviously membership, um, and now is a very good time to join if you haven't thought about doing so already. Um, we're doing a lot in terms of uh, providing legal advice where customer deposits, contractual obligations have all been thrown out of kilter. So a lot of people are looking for legal advice and guidance on contract law and stuff. So we're doing loads on that right now. Um, obviously HR with the furlough and possible redundancies, tax where people stand on VAT changes and bits and pieces. Um, and of course, general health as well, doing a lot with uh, our members whose businesses are now all working remotely and sort of the impact that's having. And of course, a huge amount of lobbying um, with the government support measures being introduced very quickly and necessarily and understandably lots of gaps in, in the provisions that were out there. So what we found ourselves doing is representing a lot of our members uh, to sort of try and feed back into the treasury to try and get them to make modifications or improvements or new measures available. So if you haven't thought about joining the chamber, now is a very, very good time. It, it will save you money in the long run, that's for sure. Um, that's the plug. Um, in terms of what else we do, we are involved in events and networking. Obviously, like everybody, we face the challenge of moving from physical to virtual, uh, and we are learning uh, new skills all the time. But we are continuing to sort of do a number of events and uh, growing that particular side of our business. We also are involved in international trade. So if you uh, have products to export, invariably you would have come into contact with us at some point because we provide mandatory documentation. But also if you import or you are just looking to break into new markets, we support a lot of the work that the Department for International Trade do. And we have our sort of chamber contacts elsewhere across the globe. And we do a lot to work with, with our members here in Kent to try and connect them internationally. But this brings us really to what I'm here to talk to you about today, um, which is to do with um, the business support side of our business. Now we bid for contracts uh, with the local authority, regional and national, um, to deliver publicly funded business support programs. Uh, and we have uh, been doing that quite a bit over the last few years. And of course, uh, it's suddenly got very busy on this side of our business at the moment, as you'd understand. One such contract we're currently running is the Kent and Medway Growth Hub. Now, I'll just explain really, so I'm going to move into this area now. This is the work that we're under which we've been doing the surveys and support for businesses. So I'm going to run through what that does uh, and how that sort of plays some relevance to today's uh, presentation. So the background to the Growth Hub, uh, it is a government funded service. It's funded by the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. 
the aim of it was to create a single point of contact. There's a lot of information flying around, um, lots of different programs launched with a local authority, national, regional, European. Um, and a lot of businesses were saying, we, we don't get to hear about these. We don't know where they are. How do we access them? Uh, it's really confusing. So that was the reason behind the, the sort of the creation of the growth hubs. There is one in each local enterprise partnership area, which essentially is the southeast. But because we're so big here in the southeast, we've actually got three three sub hubs, if you like, uh, split across the, uh, the area in Essex, East Sussex and Kent and Medway. And we're delivering the contract for Kent and Medway. Um, our other role there is to identify the need for intervention. So um, sometimes it's good to have the public sector fund stuff and, and deliver intervention. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it actually competes with the private sector. So you know, we try and make sure that we are feeding back to uh, the economic development teams that we work with to say, look, this is good, this is bad, this is sort of where the, the support is needed or where there's a market failure. And more importantly, really, uh, from the government's point of view, the whole drive really was behind trying to reduce duplication. They found that they looked at different government departments, there was a lot of similarity in programs and interventions being offered, and of course that all cost taxpayers money. So these are sort of three guiding principles of the Kent and Medway Growth Hub, and this is what we're here to sort of try and deliver. Okay, bringing it down to uh, the last few months. Okay, so, 21st of March, uh, we were contacted uh, by several local authorities um, uh, as a growth hub, and they were saying, you know, we, we need some support because businesses are ringing us asking about the Treasury announcements for support and, and, and grant schemes. So we were asked to put something together very quickly, which we did. Uh, we put together a telephone team. Um, we had eight business advisors uh, arranging callbacks, uh, and we had seven inbound call handlers taking the inbound traffic and we had a live chat service uh, on lots of council websites already uh, and that sort of got beefed up as well we were anticipating something like about 40 to 50 calls a day um, and we were being told that people were trying to ring the government's uh, tax helpline or they were trying to ring the government's business support helpline and they couldn't get through um, and it was getting very very frustrating Consequently, we didn't appreciate just how significant this, business, this this service would be, this addition. And so 24th of March, as you can see there, we suddenly found ourselves inundated with calls. And if you move to the graph down the bottom, you can see that as of the 30th of June, which sort of already a couple of weeks past that, um, you know, we had taken four and a half thousand calls. We'd done two thousand, uh, two and a half thousand callbacks, 1,600 on live chat. And it continues to grow uh, all the time. We, we are still running this originally was planned to be just a three month uh, service. So for April, May and June, um, clearly this is getting deeper and going longer and therefore we've been extended uh, this particular service, uh, the COVID-19 helpline. Um, we've moved it for another three months. So we'll be here till the end of September at the moment and this will supplement the existing work of the growth hub. Sort of inquiries we're getting, you know, not surprisingly, it's all lockdown related. You can see the sectors that we have here, hospitality and leisure, retail, and wholesale, uh, construction. These are all the key sites, obviously, that were sent, uh, sent, sent into lockdown early on. And as a consequence, of course, they were on the phone straight away saying, well, what measures are there out there? One thing that uh, we did as part of the telephone callback is we would actually survey the businesses. That, um, so when the advisor rang someone back, they'd say, okay, we've got some questions we're going to ask you, which, which um, as Ortens has highlighted, we sort of added into uh, various other reports and surveys to try and provide real-time intelligence on what we're hearing from businesses on the coal front. And we continue to do that now, and we have some further follow-up surveys planned um, to revisit the, these businesses. Now we have, at the moment, when, when I put these slides together, we have over, over 2,000 businesses that we surveyed at the time. So it's a significant um, statistical data set. And these are just the headlines really that we took from it. Um, not surprising, 94% experienced a negative impact. I think we know that now. Uh, that was pretty apparent when we look at how big a hit the lockdown had and the closure of businesses. Generally, it was a very pessimistic view uh, at the time, 84% anticipated future negative impact they, they couldn't see. Lots of them were working on the basis that the sort of three to six months of trading, that's roughly what they had. But we discovered actually very few of the businesses really had a handle on sort of the cash flow impact. One statistic which I always sort of trot out, which is that 89% uh, or it's 89.9% of the businesses in Kent and Medway employ under 10 staff. 
So that's a lot, a huge number of small and micro businesses. Now, what that does, that presents a very individualistic mindset. They don't have a financial control. They don't have a finance director. And therefore, their approach to finance and to planning and cash flow and forecasting is very much sort of an individual's point of view. And so they bring with them the sort of attitudes and mindset they might have if they were, uh, you know, handling their own personal finances. And that might explain some of the, the sort of charts that was shared earlier around people's reluctance to take on debt and their mindset and their approach to debt and all the rest of it. So I think that statistic of 89.9% are under 10 employees or less, I think you know, it is, is a significant uh, bearing on, on how the business community operates in Kent. Everyone took advantage of the furlough pretty much. Over three quarters of the businesses all decided to furlough staff straight away because it was seen as a great uh, lifeline and helped minimize some of the, the cash going out the door. And in terms of, sort of the average loss per month, it was sort of anticipated to be about 37K, which uh, when you multiply that over sort of the 50, 60,000 businesses we have here in the county, that's a lot of money and a lot of money. So it wasn't a great, um, a great prospect. Obviously, a lot of people were concerned, but, you know, people could see that there was going to be some sort of um, some sort of trajectory. And hopefully as lockdown eased, so we'd see things improve. So this was the journey that we observed over the period of the time. Um, there was an immediate exodus, and we've used that word uh, correctly because there was a sense, I think all of us will share that, that there was a sense of get out, get out of the office, get home. And that created uh, a sort of a, an attitude and a, a behavior in people that was all about shutting down and getting home. And we saw a lot of events and activities and uh, processes being shut down that actually didn't need to be shut down there was a sense everyone had to get home and, and employers were, were responding to anxiety levels from their staff who felt they needed to be home and safe and so there was this exodus and people were dashing out which which had an impact and continues to have so now dash for cash um obviously grant schemes are always appealing everyone likes a bit of free money um, and so people went chasing after that straight away um necessarily um these things were all imperfect uh, which caused a huge amount of uh, disagreement and dissatisfaction. Uh, it was very targeted at those businesses that have been ordered to lock down, retail, hospitality, leisure, businesses of a certain size, those that paid rates. And I think the general rule of thumb that you could take away from this was that if you had paid in, then you would probably get paid out. So if you're paying, doing your true tax returns, self-assessment tax returns and declaring everything, if you were um, paying yourself a wage and not just a dividend, um, and if you were sort of paying your business rates at the right rate and you were classified correctly, then you probably stood a chance of getting something back. Um, if you were outside of the loop or had been tax efficient, uh, then unfortunately you found yourself uh, on the wrong end of the stick. Job retention scheme, really, really popular. Uh, a lot of people saw that as an opportunity, a self-employment income support scheme as well. Um, although, again, we did find a lot of people had written off uh, and then sort of put their, low, um, their returns deliberately low. There is, of course, the flip side to this, where lots of large businesses that paid rates that were outside of the scope over 51K. We also had a lot of individuals that earned more than 50K uh, in their tax return year, and therefore they sort of fell outside. The government took the view that they should have reserves to be able to see them through, and so they were left hanging. <clears throat> Coronavirus business interruption, interruption loan scheme, unfortunately, was not popular. I think if you take into consideration people's attitude towards debt, that personalised attitude of, actually, I'm not sure we're going to take a big big loan, uh, certainly if there's going to be personal guarantees involved. There was a lot of toing and froing in the early stages around the, the rates, the, uh, the, uh, the personal guarantees, the credit check, uh, um, all these sort of different things, which... I can understand from a bank's perspective, we're probably trying to sort of mitigate the risk and do all the, all the right things they should do as far as their sort of lenders' money is concerned. Um, but it, it certainly didn't hit the mark at all. And unless you were going for big bucks, uh, it was something that was very unappealing and the paperwork was onerous. Uh, and if Brits dislike anything more than uh, most, it's, it's the paperwork. That then introduced, introduced the bounce back loan scheme, which was hugely popular and continues to be so. Um, terribly oversubscribed at the moment. If you don't already bank with uh, one of the uh, providers, 
then you need to sign up for a feeder account from one of the, uh, those banks and it is taking a long time. You are at the back of the queue. So if you're a customer of NatWest, Barclays, HSBC, you've probably got the money in the bank and you're all done and dusted. If you are not one of those uh, customers, you're probably still waiting to get your application in because you've got to go through the process of signing up initially. Having said that, it's been very, very popular. The, the level of loan, the no repayments for the first year, the interest-free aspect to it all, actually, it's the best bit of money you're ever going to get. And I know lots of businesses we've spoken to have uh, taken out this bounce back loan scheme in favor of uh, their finance deal because it's a far better interest rate. Um, some of the more uh, dubious characters have actually gone out and bought £50,000 worth of premium bonds and will hand the money back at the end of the year to see whether or not they've been lucky. So it's um, it's been open to abuse, but equally it has been very, very popular and it has been the, uh, the saving uh, grace uh, for many, many businesses. The local authority discretionary grant then came out and caused as much confusion as it did clarity. Um, it plugged some of the gaps. It was left to local authorities to try and interpret the regulations and then apply them, which meant the whole process was slowed tremendously. But as a general rule, it, it sorted out a lot of the small businesses that fell through the gaps. It didn't do a lot for large business, unfortunately. Um, again, that sort of attitude from the government was that they're large enough, they should be able to weather the storm, and they have already provided business interruption loan scheme if they wanted to go for it. So that was the journey. And then we sort of sort of found ourselves to where we are today. Clearly, the government is now more anxious around the economy than they are about people getting ill. Um, and that is uh, not an official view, but it is certainly the interpretation we take from all the information that's out there. The messaging needs to change and the government has started to adopt that. We've seen the change now in uh, in the introduction of wearing masks on the 24th, try and encourage, not so much to sort of cut down on the spread because I think there's mixed uh, medical advice as to whether it does or doesn't work, but what it does do is it encourages people to feel confident enough to come back out and start trading and working and, con and consuming, which is sort of what the government's recognized needs to do. So messaging needs to change and businesses need to be doing a lot more to reassure their consumers and customers that um, you know, it is safe for them to, to re-engage and pick up where they left off. There is an obvious winding down of the HMG support measures at Her Majesty's Government. Clearly, the, the deadlines are coming to, to fruition now. Uh, we're seeing step down in the furlough system. Uh, we are also seeing the ending of various um, uh, business support grant schemes, like small business grant scheme and retail hospitality and leisure. Those funds are being exploited. There is still a vibe amongst the businesses we're talking to of blind optimism that there is a hope it's not for all but for, for a large percentage that once they've locked down is released that things will come back and it is optimism rather than reality or any considered view and i think that we've we've seen that from a certain sector of the community that a very real reluctance to take on debt having then realized they need that debt, they've gone and rushed out and got the bounce back loan scheme. Some of them now are regretting that they didn't take as much as they were allowed to. They've only taken a small amount. They recognize the cash flow is a problem. So this is sort of le left the sort of the, the, the picture, if you like, where we are in a difficult situation now where businesses are sort of starting to feel uh, confident. I think it's sometimes referred to as a dead cat bounce, where we've seen the economy starting to recover upturn in sales mainly around retail and consumerism of course but we've seen a bit of an upturn projects i think if you're in it or creative digital you'll probably find you're getting lots of projects coming back online if you haven't already been really busy building websites and e-commerce platforms for a range of different people so we've seen some real sort of survival thrive scenarios but generally speaking this is not something that's looking to hold on for a long time we reckon it's going to shift a little bit the next steps now really that we're seeing is really a transition from cash to advice. Um, the government has shelled out uh, billions and billions as we all know and um, for those of us that have a PL mindset, we're wondering how that's all gonna get paid back at some point. But for now, we're seeing a transition from cash to advice. The, the interventions now are going to be proactive. They're gonna be from um, publicly funded institutions that will be offering advice, guidance and support try and head off some of the uh, some of the crashes that we're going to see from the, the small business community 
um, and trying to mitigate against some of the losses without throwing more money uh, into the well, which is where there's sort of concern. And the government's message really now is about trying to trade our way out of the crisis. Um, I think they've they've probably got some more offers out there to, to come, but we don't see many. A lot of them are really normally looking to encourage shifting. And if you look at the Chancellor's announcement uh, a couple of weeks ago, where he was talking about sort of uh, eat out to help out, the £1,000 furlough bonus, none of them in themselves were going to make a huge impact to the either the sector or the economy. But what they did is they signified this, this change in direction now where they're trying to get the, the businesses to trade their way out of the crisis. And they're trying to incentivize and sort of encourage that activity. Now, whatever the politics are behind it, I think there's clearly a message and therefore that will shape the type of interventions that are coming forward. I think from my perspective, this is sort of what I want to cover off where we are and what we've gone through. And I'm just going to move to sort of a second part now. I'm just watching time. I'm just going to go for a bit. Um, I just wanted to sort of touch on if you are going to go looking for grants or interventions, there's a few top tips really. And this is um, we at the Growth Hub, we don't always have access ourselves. We don't want the ones that necessarily issue grants but we know who the people are. We know what you have to do to apply for them. Therefore, you know, we, we always have some, some top tips, if you like, to try and sort of help work on things. So I'm just going to run through a few of those now, and then I'll, I'll sort of stop and hand over to our, to our next guest speaker. Okay, first of all, if you're going looking for funding and it's publicly funded, okay, grants or otherwise, there is no such thing as a free lunch, right? It's really obvious. Um, people aren't, you know, governments are using taxpayers' money. Therefore, they have a responsibility and obligation to use it wisely. So they're not going to give you money just so that you can uh, you can get rich yourself. They will want one of these things normally. Okay, if they're going to give you a grant, they're going to be looking for either a change in behaviour or to create some sort of economic impact. Now. If you consider the most recent set of government measures that we've had, uh, like furlough, like small business grant scheme, retail hospitality, leisure, they come under the creating an economic impact. They were really about trying to make sure that jobs were safeguarded or created uh, and businesses were kept alive. So that's really what we've seen. We're seeing a shift now where governments are trying to maybe change behaviour. So people talk about a green recovery. So you'll see there are grant schemes out there now which are encouraging. Obviously, we've seen about the domestic side, about insulating a home. We're going to see more about trying to maybe adopt more uh, home-based business uh, operations using uh, environmentally friendly vehicles and just trying to sort of use these sort of green uh, green initiatives. So we'll start to see grant schemes and support schemes that need that. Things that will also bring about diversity and inclusion. And of course, as I are saying on the uh, the trading our way out of this crisis, trying to work on, on sort of exports and develop uh, social enterprises. So it's less about shareholder profitability and more about community investment so we'll see a shift towards that that sort of drive as well but these grant schemes and all these interventions are here to create one of these two things change behavior create economic impact so if you have that in your mind you'll probably be okay when you go looking for a grant scheme otherwise you're just going to be disappointed and frustrated and thinking well i'm a good business i pay all my taxes and, and you know i do lots of good things so i should be helped okay that's fine but I think, you know, right or wrong, you need to bear in mind, okay, you ask yourself the question, am I going to create jobs or safeguard jobs? Um, is there some change in behavior here? Is, you know, what's the economic impact? You going bust or not making profits isn't necessarily going to be enough. So keep this in mind. We find it helps that people sort of stop wasting a lot of time hunting for stuff which doesn't there. The support will come normally in one of these uh, five categories, if you like. So I think many grants or loans. And the grants will tend to be either um, percentage match. So you might have to pay 70% of the project cost and a grant for the other 30%. What we will see is that balance will shift because obviously the economic climate is what it is. So we'll probably see higher intervention rates for the, lo for the grants and loans um, than, than we have done in the past. And loans tend to be interest free. They'll sometimes create space, they'll invest in property, and we've already seen some of the large infrastructure projects being talked about at the moment. We'll see those come through fairly soon. Tax breaks, again, that's been quite apparent with deferments, um, but there's been some other changes in, in tax legislation, tax law, certainly around insolvency, which 
uh, is clearly an indication the government are really looking at ways of trying to make some of that that revenue back uh, from all they've handed out recently. Lots of digital information, of course, uh, being made available, and face-to-face -face advice. This is either could be in the form of working with the university, so knowledge transfer partnership. These are all sort of face-to-face -face and, and, and advice uh, sessions, um, and that's sort of how the government will tend to bring bring these things forward. Okay. So where do you find this stuff? Well, um, Growth Hub, obviously, we have a website. Uh, you can either go for the short URL, which is askphil.biz, or you can go for the Kent and Medway Growth Hub .org .uk. Um, Askphil.biz, we try and make sure we upload all the latest uh, interventions and public funded stuff that's there. Government has a finance uh, finder, and we'll hear more from that uh, from Susan in a moment. Kent also has its own uh, programs. And again, if you look on the business pages of the kent.gov.uk website, and local authorities at the moment are doing a lot as well. So it's worth just scanning through their business pages. Um, they plug into stuff. All of these organizations have email alerts. Um, and it is really worthwhile just getting yourself plugged into those email alerts so that when uh, new stuff comes out, you've got it there in an inbox and you know about it before you have to wait for weeks for word of mouth. And unfortunately, we have had a lot of businesses who contacted us and said, I've heard about this particular grant scheme. I'm going to say, I'm really sorry, it's closed. You know, but it, it happened. Uh, so sometimes you don't want to hear about, hear things from, from the council, but actually on, on this occasion, this is really, really worthwhile. Um, that concludes my, my presentation uh, for this morning. Um, I have got some details of some of the local grant programs running. And I'm going to share those with, uh, with Kate and with Audencia so that they can be circulated amongst you all. But for now, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I'll hand back to our hosts. Thank you. Thank you, Tudor. That's marvellous. Are you there and ready, Susan? Uh, good morning, everyone. And thanks to Kate and Otenka for asking me to to join you this morning. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview about the British Bank, Business, Business Bank and, um, and some of the details that sit behind that. Um, and then um, hopefully that will fill in some of the gaps. Um, this morning, you've already heard from Orten Ortensa and uh, Tudor about some of, the, some of the work that the British Business Bank does. But um, right at the top, just to um, emphasise that the British Business Bank is the government's economic development bank. And the aim has been over the last six years or so since it was established to help make finance markets work better for smaller businesses. And that's the overall overall mission that's been working through um, and the British Business Bank is 100% owned by the UK government and it's there to, to help drive economic growth. The, the group itself, um, the British Business Bank sits um, at the top of the, the group and underneath that um, there are two commercial arms, the British Business Investments and British pa Patient Capital, and they make um, investments alongside institutional investors and the startup loans you may well um, have come across or indeed um, used. And then there are some specific investment funds, the Northern Powerhouse Fund, Midlands Engine and Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, and they're addressing particular geographical areas of the UK. So in terms of supporting smaller businesses, um, Tudor um, quite neatly mentioned, and in Kent, you've got just nudging 90% of, um, of businesses have fewer than 10 employees. Um, and this, this accurately demonstrates why um, smaller businesses are really critical to the UK economy with over half of private sector turnover in those businesses. So that's, that's the reason that the British Business Bank is focusing on, on some of those SMEs. And in terms of the, the objectives for the bank, um, it's really to increase the funding supply that's out there and to understand and help increase the diversity on, of funding mechanisms and reduce some of the regional imbalances. And um, that, that's exactly what the financial instruments are doing and business investment increasing that and growth and jobs albeit right now we're in sort of survival through to recovery and into growth but at, um, at the end of the day those those overarching um, objectives still remain remain um, solid 
In terms of increasing supply of, um, of funding, the startup loans was brought into the business bank um, family a few years ago, um, and that's mentoring and, fun, and, for, and funds to be your own boss. And they are managed through um, a separate um, a separate organisation. Um, and I would encourage you, if you fit into that, if you're less than two years old in trading, then have a look at that um, in terms of a, a source of, of finance and support that goes with it. That middle section on the screen there represents the, the matched um, funding through can, together with institutional investment. Um, and there's been a number of um, investments made. One this week was British Business Patient Capital um, investing in um, one of the life sciences um, funds to look at new ways um, um, and, and new um, approaches to certain disease areas. And then what's been talked about this morning quite a bit is the, the right hand side there is different funding options and, and, and choices of providers. And um, Hortense mentioned earlier about uh, um, initially the British Business Bank had the enterprise finance guarantee schemes and others, and they've sort of evolved and morphed into some of the schemes that are, are there right now, which very rapidly came into being um, in the, um, towards the latter end of, of March. And, and with that, um, just to give you the, the numbers as of this week, these are Sunday, Monday's numbers, and we can see that just under 48 billion pounds worth of loans have gone out to over 1.1 million businesses in the UK. And there's been a real dramatic shift in terms of what the British Business Bank has been doing. Um, in the years 2018-19, for example, supported loans through BBB was about seven, just over seven billion. And as you can see there, they are, it's now just under 48 billion. So a real shift in terms of how smaller businesses are supported. Tudor mentioned that when the coronavirus business interruption loans first came out, they didn't meet the needs of many businesses and Treasury government through the through the bank actually responded to that and that was when bounce back loans came out and they have been far and far and above the the most used facilities uh, 30 just under 33 billion has gone out to um, 1.08 um, million smaller businesses so a real um, a real important facility that has allowed um, businesses or as many businesses as possible, as the Chancellor says, not all businesses will, will survive. And those liquidations and, um, and dissolutions that uh, Ortenka just mentioned demonstrates that, but hopefully those loans will support as many businesses as possible. And then the Future Fund is the fourth um, programme, and that's convertible loan notes that convertible into shares at some point in the future. So, um, 468 million pounds worth of those have gone out through to 465 co uh, companies. So again, that's that's a, a different type of um, funding that's gone out. And I think one of the important things on that fund is just to pick out on some of the um, some of the where where the, where that funding is going. And 30% of that funding is to companies outside London. Um, this is data I picked up yesterday. 17% of that of the, those funding um, of those funded companies are in the south, which for this definition is the southeast and the southwest. Um, so as you can see, the, the British Business Bank has changed and increased capacity hugely over the last few months. And something that demonstrates that is the amount of accredited lenders out there. Um, in March, when the coronavirus pandemic first hit or hit the UK, there were about 40 accredited lenders. And now there are about, uh, there were over 100 lenders. And that's the work that the British Business Bank has been doing over the last uh, few months is to accredit new lenders. And it's still going on. So um, uh, Tudor mentioned this as well, that if you um, are, if your bank has not been open to having a discussion about some of the the guaranteed loans that the government is supporting, then have a look at some of the other lenders there. There may be a longer process, but there are um, 
over 100, as I say, lenders out there supporting um, and working as delivery partners. It's important to say that the British Business Bank is, is could be termed um, and maybe termed as a wholesale bank. So we devolve all responsibility for lending and managing the, the, the loans through to businesses to our funding delivery partners. Um, our place is in accrediting and, and being that oversight and providing the guarantees um, on behalf of government. So one of, the, one of the important things that the British Business Bank does as well is to be and build itself as a, a centre of expertise for both businesses and intermediaries. And there are a number of market insights and analysis reports that, that come out as a result of the work that myself and the bank and my team um, does across the country. And part of our work is gathering intelligence about what's happening on the ground. And then that can actually feed back into um, helping businesses find the right source of finance, but also informing, informing government um, to try to develop and evolve and refine funding mechanisms to to be the um, to be as appropriate as they can be. Um, not every business can be supported, but um, we can just do our best to listen to what's going on in the market and feed that back up the chain through to through to Treasury. The ultimate decision is with the Chancellor and Treasury. So um, that's but we can we can help inform that decision making. Two important sources of advice um, over and above what Tudor's just mentioned in terms of the growth hubs and other advisory sources of advice. One is the finance hub. And if you haven't looked at that, I would encourage you to, to go there. And there is a lot of information there about understanding funding options. There's an interactive finance and business advice finder. And there's lots of useful content to help get, um, to get investor ready. And the, the business finance guide as well um, is a simple guide to finance options um, and that's online to download now. And it's looking at the, the, the pros and cons of different types of finance. Um, so that's a, another website. The URLs are, are on the screen there. Um, I mean, one thing that I think is important to reiterate following what Tudor's just said about moving from cash to advice is actually understanding your own journey. There are um, many places you can go and different types of finance that you can access. But what's important and even more important right now, given that many businesses have taken on debt for the first time or have taken on external debt rather than using their own uh, personal savings or um, maxing out on credit cards or whatever it might be. So it's important to understand your own journey. And, and with that, the, the stuff that's important is your own business plan, knowing your own numbers, what level and type of funding you might need. Um, be clear what you need the funding for. And with, with that information, you're, you're better placed to then understand what the options are through from grant funding that might be places if you're in um, research and development or um, technology then some of the Innovate UK finance might be appropriate if you're looking at um, um, specific scientific research then some of those there may be other institutional organizations that offer that offer grants for specific science there's also the the debt finance there's different types of debt overdrafts, invoice finance, asset finance, and there's other places to go to look at that. The banks, the alternative lenders, peer-to-peer. -peer. And then what's more represented on the screen here are, are some of the options, and this is a screenshot from the Finance Hub, is when you're looking at equity investment, what type? There's angel investment, there's crowdfunding, there's, there's some more um, institutional expansion capital then a private equity. And it's really all about understanding what might be right for you. One thing that you will find on the finance, um, on the finance hub are some of those journeys to source certain types of funding. And I've just taken a, a snap here of, um, of going for that equity, crowdfunding equity. And this picks up on, on some of the points that, um, that Tudor mentioned is really understanding the numbers is absolutely critical and even more so now as 
those businesses that, that have taken out business um, bounce back loans to understand what the implications are further downstream and what happens in 12 months time when that payment holiday comes to an end, um, where things are going and what your options might be to, to either shift that into another type of funding or potentially look for um, something more, more equity funding that so selling a stake in your business to the right people. So working through these guides um, will add some um, additional resource to, to what, what help and advice you might get from the growth hubs and, and others. So drawing much of this to, to a close, um, there are so many places that you can go to look for funding for your business but um, I would advise you to seek some impartial independent guidance uh, for um, before you go to any any funders the growth hubs being a great place to start and the bank's finance hub um, will provide some additional information um, as you help dig into the details to get it right and understand the time scales involved the bounce back loans as examples are very quick response um, but if you're going for equity and other types of debt especially as you may have to change to a different bank then time scales and understanding the time scales are absolutely critical the worst thing is is not allowing enough time to be able to do that so there are um, there may be fewer options to you depending on where your business is right now but take that advice and talk through the options and, um, and look at what's out there to help you. And hopefully most or many businesses will be able to trade through this. Sadly, there will be some casualties, but we can all do our part, play our part to, um, to make sure that the right sources of finance are out there to help you. So I'll, I'll draw it to a, to a close there and, and pass back to, pass back to Kate. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay. That's marvellous. I'll give you a clap there. That's brilliant. Um, uh, yeah, thanks ever so much to Susan and to Tudor.